Meta Platforms and IBM have launched a coalition of more than 50 artificial intelligence companies and research organizations that are advocating an open model of AI. Dubbed the AI Alliance, other members include Intel, Oracle, Cornell, AMD, the National Science Foundation, Dell, Hugging Face, Red Hat, Stability AI, ServiceNow, and many others. We see this move as a way for the industry at large to collaborate with each other to ensure responsible growth and address key challenges around governance, chip supply, privacy, and to really level the playing field relative to Microsoft and OpenAI and the advantage they've gained. I'm Dave Vellante, and I'm here with Rob Stretche to unpack this announcement and give you our first take. Rob, what's your impression? I, I think it's a good thing, and I think that it really does put a line in the sand about how are we going to get to open governance? How are we going to get to being able to have actual confidence in AI? And I think there are definitely people who are starting to look at it and go from a privacy governance and you know data protection perspective, how do we really make this more transparent? So let's bring up, Ken, the money slide here, uh, the, the AI, AI Alliance members. I mean, look at this, Rob. It's it's worldwide. I mean, they are really sending a message, $80 billion in annual R&D spend, 400,000 students supported by academic in institutions. They're talking about a million staff members. I mean, California obviously has a big you know, piece of this pie, but it's really global. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the supercomputing facilities, you have UC Berkeley on there, you had Boston University with the big centers for uh, open compute cloud here in Massachusetts. Beyond that, you had, like you said, AMD, Intel, Dell, uh, Hugging Face, uh, Stability AI out of the UK, a you know, number of others, uh, all worldwide. And I think that, to me, was really the number of people who've jumped on board with this, in addition to IBM, Meta, and Red Hat, really made a lot of sense because these are the people who are building out the platforms, building out the infrastructure that AI is being built on, especially when you think about our power law and how as you get out to that long tail and things get more specific, it's gonna be on that type of compute and that kind of op more open infrastructure versus all you know being used in uh, open AI or what have you. What do you make of who's not in the coalition? Bring up the slide again if you would, uh, Ken. Um, Who's the obvious company that's missing? Yeah, funny enough, NVIDIA's not there. Um, I, and I, I think that, you know, Microsoft's not there. Uh, OpenAI is not there. Uh, you know, Google's not there. I think that, you know, those, you know, four are kind of, uh, I would say, absent, very absent in the fact that this is where, if this is really gets steam and starts to go, and this becomes a center of, where regulation is taken from and how governments start to look at and lean into, this this could be a problem for those organizations that don't want to at least participate in there. Yeah, so, I mean, it's no surprise that they're not in there, right? In particular, a lot of the industry is saying, hey, NVIDIA's gouging, you know, they're charging $250,000 for these massive supercomputers that weigh 70 or 80 pounds, and no, you can't get them from anywhere else. So, of course, they're, they're, they're driving prices up. At the same time, OpenAI and Microsoft have kind of taken off in the lead. Now, of course, they did fumble, OpenAI in particular, the, the board with the whole meltdown of the governance structure. And that's in part where I think this, re this, this resonates, with, certainly with, with me, and I think it will with, with the industry. I know we talked with our friends at ETR, probably about 10 or more uh, OpenAI and Microsoft customers right after that weekend, that disastrous weekend, and many of them, I would say over half, were turning off co-pilots. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it becomes a, if you're not part of the club and you're left behind, it becomes a, a big issue for those who are trying to figure out where do I invest, where who do I believe, who do I, you know, how do, where do I push in on? And I think that becomes big advantage to the openness. And I, I think, again, when you look at, you know, Matt Hicks is, uh, you know, the CEO of Red Hat and his comments on this as part of IBM and everything like that, but still they have their open shift, what used to be data science, but now called open shift AI platform, which really competes against some of these. I, I think one of the ones that 
Another one that was absent that was kind of surprising was Amazon, given that they're pushing in on bring your own model, a model openness and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I, I think that one was also particularly an interesting one. Maybe it's just not yet kind of thing. I asked Matt Wood um, last week at the uh, at Ray W's reInvent about, you know, have they thought about a consortia like this? And, you know, could they potentially lead it? I would have thought they would be one that would be a natural, you know, leader for this. So it is somewhat surprising that they're not. Maybe they've got some other designs on their own. Let's look at some of the, the key initiatives and the projects that the Alliance is attacking. If you bring up the next graphic, you know, Rob, this is, you know, sort of an ambitious effort by these guys. The first one right off the bat, fostering a vibrant AI hardware accelerator ecosystem. You know, what does that tell you? Yeah, I mean, that told me that there's a reason why NVIDIA doesn't want to be a part of this. If they're going to actually do something like Open Compute has done to servers and really focus on open GPU and open accelerators, I, I think this is a key to why certain people are involved. Some of the other ones that really stand out to me, creating testing uh, and benchmarking tools and methods for safe and trusted AI deployment. I think that's very much needed. And I think Certainly with IBM being one of the leaders here, I think there's a, there's a, there's a trust factor that they've built up over the years. Uh, number five, supporting AI skills, building education. That's, of course, very important. They've got a lot of universities involved in this, advocating for policies that create a healthy open AI, AI ecosystem. I mean, I think in general, the tech industry is not very good at lobbying you know, governments. That said, IBM actually has a lot of experience in that regard, so there's another you know, possibility. And so does Meta, by the way. And Meta is, you know, <laughs> relatively new to that game and under right. a lot more fire. Yeah. IBM's used to it from, yeah. you know, the, the, the DOJ in the 80s yeah. um, and uh, 70s, actually, in 80s. But yeah, Meta more recently. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the other factors around large language models. I mean, IBM's got Granite, AWS has Titan, and even, you know, some of the later entrants into the market. You know, last week at AWS reInvent, there was a lot of talk about this thing called Q, which is essentially their co-pilot. What was it trained on? We suspect it was trained on Titan, but Titan, you know, doesn't follow those scaling laws that um, that we, we've come to know that are associated with these more advanced large language models. So we asked IBM, uh, is Granite a, 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 a characteristic of those scaling laws that we've come to know, and they said yes, Granite is the same has this is in the same algorithmic class of transformer-based LLMs as others, and so far obeys so far is the operative phrase there obeys similar scaling trends as these other models, notably the Chinchilla scaling laws. So, what are the Chinchilla scaling laws? So the Chinchilla scaling law for training transformer language models, Rob, is just says that when given an increased budget in terms of floating point operations per second to achieve the optimal compute, the number of model parameters and the number of tokens for training the model should scale approximately in equal proportions. But as we wrote last week, I want to share this with you and get your opinion, George Gilbert and I in Breaking Analysis, we talked about Titan not being of that class because it didn't adhere to the scaling attributes around compute power, model size, parameters, and training data Maybe I'm inferring a little different than the chinchilla laws of, uh, 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 of scaling. What do you make of that? I, I think it goes, what we're looking at goes beyond what the chinchilla laws are. And I think that really is one of the keys is that you got to look at the other costs associated with it because not everybody's going to build. In fact, most people will not or organizations will not be building a, their chat GPT. They will be using small, more segmented models or SLMs, those smaller segmented language models so that they can really be focused. And what they're going to do is look for the right foundational model that's been trained on the right data that they believe in and they understand and is transparent. Then they're going to go and actually tune that foundational model to their own data, and then they will deploy that for inference. So I think when you start to follow this string through, I, I you can't have everything go up at the same time at the same level. If you start to say, okay, you have my tokens and my floating point, you know, as the floating point uh, and the, as the floating points go up, 
so do the tokens and the number of parameters. Well, that makes sense, but at the same time, it, at what cost and at what expense do you have that happening? And I think it doesn't take that into account, which is why I think what we have is goes well beyond that. So Grant has 20 billion parameters. So the, the question is, as it scales to 200 billion parameters or a trillion parameters, how do those scaling laws you know, get, get affected? Uh, you know, we'll see. But in general, IBM's posture, they've got a track record in open source. Um, similar to, to Amazon, they're talking about LLM optionality. So whether it's Anthropic, Stability AI, uh, of course, Hugging Face gives you, you know, a lot of options for, for LLMs, Llama 2. So that's, that's smart. Customers want choice. But at the same time, if you don't have that core foundation model like in OpenAI where Microsoft has locked it up, or in the case of Google, uh, then you really do want to diversify. By the way, those companies can diversify as well. So, um, you know, it seems to me that Granite's differentiation is you've got, you've got you know, data sources they're indemnifying um, in production, right. which is, I think, unique. You know, so they're really focusing on this enterprise ready piece of it, especially when you start using these co-pilots and, you know, they're what they call Watson Code Assistant, what Q is from Amazon, what, you know, Microsoft's co-pilots. Uh, those are those are all critical. And, and I think, you know, the real focus on governance here and model and domain specificity in a moment, we'll bring up the, the power law, but your, your take first. Yeah, I, I think it is, it gets into that, how many parameters do you really need for your use case to be accurate? And how much is that gonna really cost you? What data, it's more about the data because it comes back to garbage in, garbage out. And if you don't have the right data in there to either actually at the foundation or in there to tune the model, you're really gonna end up with just garbage. and that's when you start to get those hallucinations and you start to worry about what is leaking back into the models as well as you further tune those models on your own data. So I, I think, again, accuracy and cost are two things that definitely go up at as the parameters go up, as the number of tokens go up. And I think what is going on is that from a sustainability and a power perspective, that also yeah. becomes more power hungry as you start to scale up as well. So the power law of Gen AI, something to develop uh, by the Cube research team, it's on the horizontal uh, uh, axis is, or the vertical axis is the size of the model. So you're going to have those big foundation models uh, like OpenAI, like Anthropic, certainly Google, uh, that are really going to sort of dominate the, the market and, and get a lot of attention. But then you're going to have a long tail, and that long tail is going to be all about domain specificity and model specificity, which is on that sort of horizontal axis. And then you have the torso, which traditionally in a lot of these power models is a hard right angle. That torso is pulling up because you have all this open source models. You've got Meta, you've got you know a, 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 a Falcon, you've got a Stability AI, Inflection, Glean, Lightrix, Jasper, on and on and on, pulling that torso up. And, and to the right. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic here. And I think IBM is really playing off that with its emphasis on governance. I, I, I do. I believe that that pull and that openness pulling up on the torso is really about, hey, how do you do larger models at a lower cost, lower power on premise with data you know? And maybe you start out at you know 20 billion Maybe you move to a Llama 2 with 70 billion. Maybe you go somewhere else, but do you really need a trillion for your use case? And I think that becomes the trade-off. Do you need to go take over 100,000 GPUs to actually train your model or to tune your model on that foundational model? I, I, I look at it for most organizations, the answer is probably no. If they're just trying to automate their HR and their people trying to figure out how to do direct deposit, I do not see people needing a trillion parameter model to go and do HR. Now, it may be nice if that's also going and rewriting all your HR policies. And I think it goes to that breadth of use case that you're looking at really ties very tightly to those parameters and the amount of tokens and follows the chinchilla law, but it's it's use case specific. Yeah, and that very that domain specificity, you're right. We didn't need a trillion parameters to train the 
CubeAI, the CubeAI.com. Check that out. I think high marks on the initiative. I love the focus on the governance, the model specificity, and the collaboration across the industry. It's unclear what the governance structure is of, of this. When we had our little private briefing, you know, that was kind of TBD, but I have no doubt they'll figure that out. Um, maybe modeling after similar to the CNCF, uh, but I think overall high marks is something the industry needs here. I'll give you the final word. Yeah, I think it, it's de desperately needed. In fact, the CNCF has actually partnered up with some of these other uh, open, I guess you could say AI consortiums that are looking at governance and things of that nature. And I think that this is a key to really bringing, uh, I guess you could say transparency and some amount of sanity to the governance over AI so that we have kind of a almost a united voice, a little bit more united voice going back to the governments because I think that's going to be the key to when regulation comes down the pipe. Great analysis, Rob. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching this Analyst Angle. We'll see you next time.